Hello, good evening. I'm I'm Gail Hodges Bird. I am the chairman of the American Academy in Berlin, the chairman of the Board of Trustees, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. I am joined by one of my fellow trustees, Christine Wallach here, and Bern Vonderplanitz, who is our senior counselor and who uh, has supported us and helped us grow this institution for the last 21 years. So I welcome you both uh, here and thank you for your service to the Academy. Um, I am not supposed to be standing here tonight. Um, uh, I am sadly standing here because uh, our fellow trustee, Marina Kellen French, uh, uh, had an accident last night and is is in the hospital and she is unable to be here. So I am standing in to introduce our distinguished visitor tonight, uh, Dan Weiss. Um, uh, as, uh, as a lot of you know, Marina flew over just for this evening's uh, lecture by Daniel Weiss and tomorrow evening's lecture by uh, our Sir David Chipperfield. And uh, she's going to miss both, but um, and she's going to be fine. and. Uh, uh, but she's, I'm standing in for her. Um, I wanted to also welcome Christina Higgins uh, from the American Embassy. Christina, you and your husband, Jock, I know are new to Berlin, so welcome to you. Uh, Christina is the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs. And uh, Sir David Chipperfield, who needs no introduction from me, is also here with us this evening. Um, because Marina uh, worked so hard on uh, bringing both of our distinguished visitors here this evening, uh, she also worked on her opening introductory remarks. So I uh, thought that rather than try to paraphrase her, I would read her introductory remarks of her friend, Dan Weiss, who she was so pleased to have brought here. So with that, I will read uh, Marina's introduction, Dan, if it's okay with you. Um, uh, I am playing two roles tonight. First, if as many of you know, this was the home of my grandparents. It was always a place that rippled with artistic curio curiosity, a real salon for ideas and conversation. So I am thrilled that we can continue that spirit through these lectures. Second, I am a trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and I have the great pleasure of supporting the vision and ambition of tonight's speaker, the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Daniel Weiss. Dan, it is a great pleasure that you are here at the American Academy tonight. Dan Weiss became the fifth president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art on July 1, 2015, and was appointed president and chief executive officer in June 2017. Prior to that, he served as the museum president and chief operating officer with approximately 2 million objects in its collection, representing more than 5,000 years of artistic achievement from around the world, 7 million visitors annually, and an operating budget of 320 million. Oh, if only we had that. <laughs> I'm very envious. <laughs> The Met is one of the largest and most diverse art museums in the world. During the previous decade, he served as the 14th president of Haverford College, and before that, as the 16th president of Lafayette College. At Haverford, he led the effort to prepare a comprehensive strategic plan and secure the funds to support new interdisciplinary initiatives and major renovations to the library, new facilities for biology, psychology, and music, as well as a new center for visual culture, arts, and media. From 2005 to 2013, Dan served as president of Lafayette, where he worked to increase the size of the permanent faculty by 10%, developed revised curricula, introduced new interdisciplinary programs, and, creative, and created innovative alliances 
in the city of Easton. During his tenure, Lafayette became the only college in the nation to receive a collaborative grant from the MEA under its Urban Arts Initiative, a leading voice on liberal arts colleges in a changing higher education landscape Dan Weiss co-edited, Remaking College, Innovation and the Liberal Arts, which was published in 2014. Dan has written or edited five books and numerous articles on the art of the Middle Ages and other topics, including higher education and the Second World War. His research has been supported by grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Harvard University, Yale University, and the Samuel H. Kress Foundation. In 1994, he won the Van Cortlandt Elliott Prize from the Medieval Academy of America for a first article in Medieval Studies judged to be of outstanding quality. He received three awards for teaching excellence as a member of the Johns Hopkins faculty and was the recipient of the Aaron O. Hoff Peace, People's Choice Award at Lafayette College in 2006. The holder of three honorary degrees, I'm almost getting dizzy reading all of this. <laughs> The owner, the holder of three honorary degrees, he is a member of the Society of Scholars at Johns Hopkins University, and in 2013 was the recipient of a star award from the Posse Foundation for contributions to higher education. In 2018, he received the Leadership and Society Award from Yale, the Yale School of Management and the Centennial Medal from the Foreign Policy Association. Um, I'm sure Dan Marina could have gone on, but this uh, this ends her. For, yeah, um, yeah, we'll all get dizzy, but it is my great pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening. It really is a special pleasure to be with all of you this evening. And I, too, would like to just express my thanks to Marina, whose idea it was not only that I come and spend time at the Academy, but also that she would take me around Berlin and Potsdam and Dresden. And she did that up until the moment of her accident. The Academy has no stronger champion than Marina, and neither does Berlin, at least in New York and at the Metropolitan. So I'm very grateful to be here. This is an extraordinary community in which to present one's ideas and engage in discussion. I look around the room and I'm inspired by your interest and your engagement and very grateful to have the chance to spend some time with you. So my topic this evening is museums, society, and the public interest. And what I would like to do is talk a little bit about what I've seen in my role as president at the Met. I've been there for four years. It is actually my first museum job, so I can't really talk about the long history of museums as a staff member. But as an art historian, I've worked with them through much of my life, and I also have lots of experience in universities. And several of the themes I'm going to raise this evening, I think, have resonance both in higher education as well in cultural institutions. What I'd like to do is, is raise a series of issues that I've been thinking about. In some cases, I have a perspective on them, and in others, not so much. But they are the issues we struggle with. It's what we think about. It's what we're trying to do more effectively as we look to the future and the role of the Metropolitan and other museums around the world. And I can think of no better room in which to throw out some ideas than this one. And there will be time for discussion afterwards, so I'll await your answers and suggestions at that time. Um, but let me begin with just a general observation about some of what I've seen. In the museum world, as in almost every realm of modern life, we are today challenged by an environment of rapidly increasing complexity, fundamental change, and no small measure of uncertainty in matters relating to governance, content and program, globalism, cultural heritage, financial sustainability, and even core purpose. Whereas I recognize that it is something of a commonplace for each generation to make the claim that their own is exceptional, and perhaps it is even true at some level, I make it nonetheless for ours. Recently, I encountered such a claim made quite persuasively in 1997 by Michael Brenson. He wrote, and I quote, 
Culture is no longer considered essential to government policymaking. It is no longer seen as a necessary part of our argument to other countries about, about what democracy is and how it works. The fear of art and culture reflects a loss of confidence in the ideas of democracy. I'm not saying people don't believe in democracy, even desperately. It remains the defining idea in America's sense of itself. But there is a hollowness in the way the word is used in our political life. The timidity I see in many museums disturbs me. By this I mean much more than any reluctance to show art that provokes. What I mean most of all is a fear of engagement." Unquote. If I reflect on Brenson's concerns expressed 22 years ago, I am compelled to say that I see further erosion in the role of museums as places of serious engagement with ideas of consequence and with fundamental questions about the role of culture in society, or even more generally, about what defines a cultural experience. All of that is in a state of change. To be sure, these challenges are part of a much larger set of issues we are facing in the United States, in Germany, and globally. Because I believe that under such circumstances, museums, like universities, should play an especially important role as places for deep reflection and discussion we might also see this as a moment, in a very real sense, as a time of opportunity. For much is at stake if we are not to be swept away, or at least rendered irrelevant, in a time of political, social, and economic upheaval. As I reflect on these challenges, which I will outline in just a moment, we should begin by acknowledging that at a time when the public has an overwhelming array of options for how to spend their time, museums are increasing in popularity almost everywhere. And this is an entirely good thing. If there is a risk of irrelevancy, it is not so obvious to the increasing numbers of visitors who come each year to the Met Museum Island here in Berlin and other major museums around the world. So let me be more specific and outline some of the issues I see before us. I'm going to mention eight, and I don't have any answers yet. I'll raise some of them in a bit more detail in a moment. But these are the kinds of topics we struggle with at the Met and I can imagine here in Berlin. First of all, how do we define a cultural experience in the first place? And what meaning does it have to the public? This is changing rapidly. Second, who are we serving? And are we able to meet the needs of everyone? As our demographics increase, as the audiences grow, as the range of interests and experiences and connections to culture evolve in productive ways, what should our program be? What should our message be? What kind of research should we support? What kind of exhibitions should we field? This is a real challenge for us. What role, if any, do digital platforms play in an object-centered world? The answer to that is actually easier than it sounds, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. Who should pay for culture? This is particularly an issue in the United States. In an environment of ever-increasing costs, in a commensurate drive towards commercialism and its twin consumerism, how does one build a sustainable financial model that fits within a mission-driven institution? The fifth of my eight questions, in case you're keeping track. <laughs> How and when should we engage the public in controversy on questions of artistic or cultural importance, especially in a society that is already polarized and increasingly incapable of strenuous debate? Should we be pushing the envelope or offering a place of calm and stability? Should we be doing both? Six, whose museum is it? How should these institutions be governed? Is the current model the most well seated to achieve, suited to achieving these objectives? Governance is actually the most important question before us, I think. Seven, whose art is it? How should we think about cultural heritage, property rights over lar large spans of time, imminent risk to cultural property before us today in the world, changing perspectives about globalism, and simply doing the right thing as we see it today? which is not the same as we saw it 10 years ago, and maybe not in 10 years into the future. And then eight, the last of these questions, should we decide, and if so, how, to draw limits on who can participate in funding our institutions, or even more fundamentally, whose work can be included in our collections? I'm speaking about artists who might be bad actors, who behave poorly. I'm speaking about donors who have investment records or business ownership issues that are questionable. We face those issues every single day, and we don't have answers for them. We don't even engage them until recently. And that's, I think, a failure of leadership on our part. I'm going to talk about that. 
So what I'd like to do now that I've teed up a whole host of complicated questions is not answer many of them, but outline from a slightly um, autobiographical perspective from the Metropolitan's point of view how we have evolved in our own thinking about these questions and some of the experiences that we've had which help give meaning to some of these issues. And to do that, and I'll do this quickly, a little overview on the Met for those of you who haven't been there and for those of you who have, a little brief history lesson. This is the institution as we see it today, and in many ways the Metropolitan is one of the most interesting and successful social experiments in American history. The idea for the Met began modestly. In 1870, a group of business leaders were in Paris, New York business leaders, that's an important part of my story. And New York at that time was a burgeoning metropolis with a rising financial center and strong industrial base and no cultural life, and it was a savage community in many ways. So these business leaders thought we need culture, and they saw the Louvre, and they thought rather preposterously, we want that, we're going to build that. <laughs> and they came back to New York with the idea that they would create an institution on the scale and ambition, visibility and prestige of the Louvre. They had no art. There was nothing in any collection to give uh, any kind of serious consideration to that idea. They were able to persuade the, the city leaders, the mayor of New York, to provide land and a building, and they would seek to find the art and begin to build a, a cultural institution from the ground up with no collections. And this they did. So the first museum, the met first Metropolitan, is the one you see on the screen here on the left-hand side. It was a rented building further down Fifth Avenue. And small though it is, they didn't have much to put in there anyway. So the earliest collections consisted of a few modest gifts of third-rate art, plaster casts of various things they were able to gather together, and some donations of living artists who had helped to create the museum, several of them who went on to become eminent, but we didn't know that at the time. <laughs> the ambition, though, was present right from the start. So shortly after 1870, the museum was moved to its present location in Central Park. The city donated the land, and I think what's most interesting about this image and this moment is the first building they constructed in the Metropolitan is the Medieval Hall. For those of you who have been there, it's where the Christmas tree is. It's 200, it's not always where the Christmas tree is, but it is there in December. The rest of the year there are other things, medieval art. But that was the original museum, that building, and it was about 100 or 200 yards away from Fifth Avenue. And when they built it then, they knew they would find their way back to Fifth Avenue. So the first building in the Metropolitan was already contemplating a building of the size of the Louvre. And in fact, today, my facilities team tells me that our building is that much bigger than the Louvre. <laughs> so um, there we are. But the institution, this was the wing that was uh, around, the time, around 1900. This was the second or third addition to the museum. And it is several hundred yards away from Fifth Avenue. The museum grew quickly, and at the turn of the century, shortly there in the early part of the 20th century, the, uh, the Robert Morris Hunt wing was built, which is where the main stairs are, and then either on the, both sides, the north and the south of the main wing, the McKean, Mead, and White wings were built. And the museum then began to look like the institution that we see today. All the while, the collections were growing increasingly, uh, so that today the museum we see is this 2.4 million square foot structure, that it sits on Central Park with two million works of art, as, as Gail said, an operating budget over $300 million. We have 17 curatorial departments, six conservation departments. We have the largest art history faculty in the world, the largest conservation faculty in the world, one of the largest art libraries in the world, and so forth. So that ambition, which was somehow embedded in this original vision, was realized. And it was realized one gift at a time with very modest support from the government. <coughs> And I'm going to come back to that issue a little bit later. Initially, the city said they would provide the building and they would provide the land, but it was up to the museum to fund it, uh, mostly. And today, the city of New York provides about 9% of our operating budget, and the rest of the money is raised independently through our endowments and through annual giving and various re revenue-generating activities. So the museum has effectively outgrown the support that it was originally given by the city, but it has become a very large, complicated enterprise. Which raises the question as to what actually the museum does. When it initially was opened, it hung art on the walls and it had some educational programs. And if you came on a couple of days during the week, you could have a tour. Today, the museum has, if one adds up all of the activities we do 
special tours, conferences, colloquia, exhibitions, live arts, performances. We do about 38,000 events a year in this building. So it is a busy place. It consists of 52 different departments, as I mentioned, 17 curatorial departments, and um, six conservation departments. A university press, we publish 35 books a year, scholarly books of original uh, content, and so forth. So one of the questions then is, um, what should the Metropolitan be doing? Do we have the mission right? Do we even understand the mission? As the world evolves, as thinking evolves about what cultural institutions ought to do, the Metropolitan has become a comprehensive cultural institution that looks and feels to me more like a university than an art museum. And this is in no way a critical statement, it's just an observation. And what I see every day, and all of the work that we do, then therefore the mission on the one hand is embraced about connecting people in fundamental ways to works of art. How we actually do that is far more complicated. We have, for example, now a very active and vibrant live arts program, which includes Schubert performances and Beethoven and classical music of the sort people at the Met are used to, but also hip hop dancing in the Arms and Armor Gallery to give people a sense, I guess, in part, of the challenge associated with moving dynamically and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and to engage new audiences to come there because they want to see a dance, a hip hop performance, and they look around them and they see something about our history and the role of armor and so forth. Live arts is an, a very significant part of the programming of the museum and it wasn't always that way. Some years ago we made the decision, in addition to the cloisters, to take on, at least on a temporary basis, the old Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue, the, the, we now call it the Breuer, the Met Breuer. It's effectively a Kunsthalle where we have, on a regular basis, rotating exhibitions, most of them addressing issues associated with modern and contemporary art as the museum seeks to find its way to a thoughtful, engaging, serious connection to the art in the world around us. There is, in our view, a proper way for the Met to do that without becoming a modern art museum or without chasing the great modern art museums in New York but to adding to that conversation in fundamental ways. And this Breuer was an opportunity for us to begin to think about that. So we leased this building. We will be turning it back to the Whitney next year after five years of using it. It has been in many ways a very successful experiment, also an expensive one, but very <laughs> successful. And what we've learned through that process is a great deal about the kind of programming we would like to initiate in the fields of modern art, but also that we've reaffirmed our commitment to the main building, what the Metropolitan does so well, almost singularly so, is to all of the art of 5,000 years is in one building. So a visitor can walk through the museum for days and experience cultures juxtaposed in interesting ways with a very strong curatorial presence and an educational program that enhances that kind of learning across difference. And so our commitment to modern art is to do it in the main building. But in the meantime, we've added to the complexity and, and expense of our institution by having this very helpful and thoughtful experiment. We maintain an exhibition program that is probably the most ambitious in the world. We do about 60 major exhibitions a year in all of the fields that we've described. Of those 60, about 15 of them are very major exhibitions of the sort that international museums do. And I just present this slide not so that you can read it in the 30th row, but rather you can get a sense for the complexity of programming the exhibitions in this institution and what goes into that, the kind of staff that are required to do that. But also the discipline associated with reminding ourselves what are we here to do? What kind of educational and scholarly mission are we advancing with a program like that? Which audiences are we serving? Who are we leaving behind? How do we afford this? These are all questions we deal with on a regular basis. We believe very deeply, not only in the presentation of works of art, but in their maintenance and conservation. So we have invested very substantially in very strong conservation programs in order to take care of our own collection, but also that of colleagues in New York. We do a lot of conservation work for others, and it's fundamental to the premise of the museum. One of the challenges that we face, which may or may not be as visible in Berlin, is that much of what we do is not visible to the public but very little of what we do is funded by anyone else. So how do we go about making the case that the Metropolitan should deserves an operating budget of $320 million that requires people to pay various kinds of admission fees to come when so much of what we do is not seen by the public but part of the good of the institution and its contribution to the world? 
Part of that is advocacy and doing a better job of telling our story, and this we are doing. And part of it is believing in the conviction that what we're doing is the right thing over the long term for the institution. And as we face financial exigencies of all sorts, and I'm going to talk about that almost existential problem in a few moments, one needs to come back to really understanding the mission of the institution. It may seem painfully obvious that the mission is clear. It is not so obvious. And in my experience in nonprofit organizations, very often it's not so clear. So that discipline begins, with, it is the point of departure for the work we do, and it should discipline our decision making and the priorities that we set. Having said all of that, the Metropolitan does an awful lot. So one part of the museum's role in the world is to provide this extraordinarily vital, almost cultural commons. If museums were once citadels of art, elevated on stairs and imposing buildings that only the educated should feel comfortable visiting, and everyone else should know better to just stay away, which was once the premise of these museums, even if they said publicly otherwise, they weren't really for everyone. If the goal today is to create an institution that is a public commons that has all of these things happening, it is also important to remember that for so many visitors, what they're seeking is something far simpler. And it is a place of stability, of intellectual seriousness, of beauty and permanence. And this is, a, in order to point that out, I have a beauty shot on the screen of the Roman court within the Metropolitan. And for those of you who visited the museum 20 years ago, that was the cafeteria. Um, it's a beautiful space. We work very hard, as all museums do, to create spaces that have that kind of effect for people to give them what they're seeking. And it is not necessarily a contradiction to say that on the one hand we do that for the public and on the other we want to provoke them. We want to engage them. We want to invite them to think differently about their world. So we try to do that as well. One of the key questions that we face as an encyclopedic institution is what does that actually mean? What should we collect? We tell the world that we have 5,000 years of art of all cultures around the planet for 5,000 years. But this is decidedly not entirely true. There are many cultures for which we have no representation, and there are others that we have far more material than um, one might guess. For example, I mentioned we have 16 curatorial departments, of which two represent 90% of the planet. And that would be the Department of Ancient Americas, Oceania, and Africa. That's one department. That's three quarters of the planet. And the Department of Asian Art, as if Asian art was a thing. Um, that's a department. So if we, those two are probably 90% of the world. And we have several departments that are Eurocentric, maybe five. So the world is shifting. Our perspective is shifting. Our organization needs to evolve with those shifting perspectives. And we need to do justice to our increasing sophisticated view of what global institutions do. But we ask that question on a regular basis. What does it mean to be encyclopedic? Indeed, 50 years ago, we didn't have anything from Asia or Africa or South America until Nelson Rockefeller's great gift to us, uh, which put us on the map for, as it were, pre-Columbian art and African art, what was then called primitive art. We addressed the question of whether we should be collecting modern art. And what does that mean? Is Pollock a modern artist? Well, yes, for sure. Should we go beyond that? Should we collect the work of living artists? Maybe we should collect Jasper Johns, but what about artists we haven't heard of but who may be famous later, who, who are doing work that we think is important? Those are the kinds of questions we think about. This is a view of the ancient America's Africana Oceana galleries to give you a sense of what we have created in the last several decades. We are about to embark on a major renovation of this space in order to bring it up to date, not only aesthetically, it is a tired looking gallery, but also to bring it up to date from a scholarly point of view and an exhibition point of view. As we learn more, we want to present the material in ways that's more resonant with, um, with the public and with the scholarly world. We are now in a very significant way in the costume business, as it were. That's not fair. We, are, we have a department called the Costume Institute, and it is a very significant part of the museum's public connection. People come to this museum more than any other reason to see the work of the Costume Institute and the exhibitions that we have put in place. To be sure, the Costume Institute has been around for many decades, and it has always been an important part of our community. But it now, in many ways, dwarfs public interest in everything else. So we have to think carefully about how do we develop exhibitions using costume as a way to bring people in and to be thoughtful and scholarly in our presentation, but also invite them to see the world a little bit differently. This most recent exhibition called Heavenly Bodies 
presented images of Christianity represented in clothing in the contemporary era, but also we had a special presentation of, of clothing, mostly papal garments, uh, from the Vatican that have never been loaned before, ever. And they were on view at the Met. So we had this really interested, bifurcated audience. People who came from religious groups from all over the country to venerate the Vatican, and then they saw these, exhibit, these displays of modern, and, uh, modern dress as well. And we think there was great synergy there and opportunity for shared learning. So we think about those things. That's the medieval hall, by the way, the original museum that the Metropolitan built in the 1870s. Related to our encyclopedic mission is the question about the role of digital. What should digital platforms do for an institution that takes seriously direct connection with works of art themselves? The object is primary. This is no longer such an interesting question because most museums now understand how to do that. We do it in three ways. One, we develop technologies and, and various kinds of uh, access that allow people to have a better visit. The hours of the museum, how you get in, where you go, wayfinding, the uh, tour apparatus, all of those things can be done accessed by your phone. Those are the instrument, instrumental uses of digital capabilities. We have built a very strong presence around using digital capabilities on our website to enhance learning around the world. We have over 30 million visits to our website each year, and many of these people will never visit the Metropolitan and are connecting with our material and our content to learn about art. So we see that as a fundamental part of our responsibility as well, including the timeline of art history, which is a comprehensive program on our website that allows people to connect in a dynamic way to any work of art, any culture, any period that they wish to learn about. And this is visited by about 11 million people a year, and it's used as sec effectively as a textbook in school all over the country and all over the world. So that's a, that's a related function for the digital platform. Again, I've, every museum does both of those things. It's a matter of emphasis, investment, and focus. So we do, and then the third area of digital is we're now collecting digital art of all sorts, and we have to have new kinds of training and new kinds of curatorial and conservation expertise when we collect moving image uh, works of art, we have to figure out how to save them and preserve them and all of that. So we've invested very significantly, but not in surprising ways, in that kind of thing. So one set of issues is how an institution like the Metropolitan evolves to keep pace with the world without losing sight of our history, our core mission, and our ability to serve that mission effectively over the long term. What I'd like to do now is just touch on three slightly more complicated issues for which I don't have a ready answer, but we're working through them. And these are issues you're facing in Berlin as well, to be sure. The first of them is how do we engage with the art of other cultures? I'm talking about collection building, but also cultural heritage. The Metropolitan benefited in the early years of our history by having direct archeological access to great sites in the world. After J.P. Morgan suggested it, who was the president of the museum in the early part of the 20th century, we have been excavating in Egypt every year for more than a century. And for the first half century, we were able to share with the Egyptian government what we found. We now have the largest collection of Egyptian art outside of Egypt because of that. And much of it is archaeologically important. We have the context. We can tell stories and provide scholarship about that collection in ways that has been fundamentally important to the field. But we cannot do that anymore. Now we excavate, our finds are given to the Egyptian government, we contribute to the field in a very different way, but we have not backed away at all from that core commitment to contributing to the scholarly field by doing archaeological work on two sites in Egypt every year for the last half century. What you see here is just one example of the kind of displays we're able to, to present because we have a deep understanding. We have glorious, beautiful things. We also have archaeologically interesting, complicated things. Collecting Egyptian art is no longer such an easy thing to do. And it's, we are an active collecting institution. And that is a perilous thing to be doing in many of these fields that are now enormously complicated around questions of cultural heritage. You may have read in the media just recently that the Metropolitan was obligated to return this coffin of Nejemunk, the high priest, it's a Ptolemaic work, a gold coffin, a magnificent object that we acquired two years ago from a private dealer in a great ceremony of what a lucky acquisition it was for us to have this object. 
And then it was disclosed to us a few months ago that the, 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 the object had been looted and that all of the materials that we were presented with had been forged. So two things happened. One, we acknowledged the terrible mistake that we made. We apologized to the Egyptian government and we returned the object immediately. And the other is we revisited our procedures and our policies to make sure we're not doing anything to enhance the market of looting. We don't want to do anything that is obviously bad for the institution, financially irresponsible, and undermines the trust the public have placed in institutions like the Metropolitan. This was a difficult moment for us, and we've learned from it. It also tells us that the world of acquisitions in all of the ancient fields, not just Greece and Rome, as it had been for so many years, or the ancient Near East as it is today, but everywhere is fraught with peril, and that one needs to be very careful about how one acquires works of art at any level, including especially ones like this. Another problem we face indirectly, but all of us face, is the issue of cultural heritage. What can we do, what should we do to help preserve the great sites of the world that are being desecrated and destroyed through acts of terrorism and other kinds of vandalism and um, bad behavior? I show you as one example of this sort of tragedy an image of the city of Dura Europis. This was a late antique city in the third century AD. It was a Roman border town that had within its walls the cultures of more than a dozen different communities living together quite peacefully, remarkably so, in the middle of the Syrian desert, until the city was overrun in 256 AD by a siege laid by the Sasanians. Shortly after, they laid siege to the city, and they basically um, took what they wanted and abandoned the city. It was buried in the sand to be discovered only in the early part of the 20th century, and it was systematically excavated starting in the 1920s for decades. And this is the spot where the oldest Christian church in the world was found, this is the spot where the only painted synagogue, narrative-rich images of a painted synagogue from the third century survive, which is, of course, historians didn't think such things existed at all. So we had to rewrite all of the textbooks. There are many, many things this site provided to us by slowly, thoughtfully excavating it over the course of decades. The image on the, on the right, all those little dots are marks of looting. The city has been completely destroyed by ISIS. It is no longer archaeologically useful, and even though the city may be re returned to us, there's nothing more that we can get from it from an archaeological standpoint. What can we do about that? What can we at the Metropolitan do? What can we do in Berlin? This is the museum at Palmyra. You all know the story of the terrible tragedies that took place in Palmyra. We were all very, very upset, deeply concerned. What can we at the Metropolitan do? And our curators and our staff mobilized an action plan. There are things we can do. One thing we can do is tell their stories. So we have an exhibition right now that just opened, The World Between Empires, which tells the story of Dura Europis and Palmyra and all of these other ancient cities from the third, second, third, fourth centuries AD that lived between Parthia to the east and Rome to the west and learn how to live in complicated, heterogeneous societies where they shared language and culture and art and religion. This exhibition celebrates Palmyra, among other things. So one thing we can do is tell those stories in a thoughtful and sophisticated way that engages people's interest and consent attention. There are other things we can do that are more pragmatic, but maybe even more important. We reached out to the communities in, in Syria and Iraq, the museum leaders there, who were encamped in their museums for months at a time, trying to protect their objects from vandals and looters and soldiers and criminals. They were barricading themselves in these museums. We asked them what we could do to help. We organized a conference to share our knowledge, but we could not invite them to the United States because we don't have treaties that allow them to visit us. So we organized a conference in Turkey, and many of these curators literally walked to Turkey from Syria and Iraq to attend this event. We organized backpacks, as you see on the scene on the left, the screen on the left, that were filled with material that would allow those museum officials to document their collections. Basically, a portable registrar's office. Cameras, recording equipment, all of what is necessary to provide scholarly documentation of what's in their hands. Each one of these backpacks cost about $15,000 to fill. We raised the money from our own donors. We, I don't know, produced 20 of them, and we went to Turkey and trained them in how to use them. And what you see on the right is an image of them 
being trained, and then they took their backpacks back to begin documenting their collections. It's a modest gesture, but it's something. As we think about these issues, we have to mobilize more effectively. How do we protect cultural heritage? How do we think about what we can do beyond our own walls? This is a creative question more than anything else. Of course, there are other larger questions, which I'll just touch on very briefly, related to the kinds of issues you're facing here and in France. What should we do about the Benin bronzes? What should, what should we do about collections that may have been gathered at times when the rules were different? Should we return that material? How do we think about that question? The president of France, had the, uh, Macron, had this idea to give back these Benin bronzes, which is a laudable and in many ways admirable gesture. But it does beg the question, how do we weigh international law? How do we think about the weight of history and the present circumstances of these objects? What do we think about the various publics who have a vested interest in this material? both the local ones, but also those globally who are concerned with this material? What larger objectives are accomplished by having works of art from various cultures throughout the world? If we at the Metropolitan gave back everything, we would not have a comprehensive museum. We wouldn't have anything. And all of those cultures would tell their own stories. And no one in New York or any other visitor to New York might learn about that. So how do we find a balance around telling those stories in a distributed and thoughtful, collaborative way? <coughs> Ultimately, those answers are not easily identified. And I don't think anyone who makes a bold pronouncement is thinking about the long game. One needs to avoid political posturing in order to find a sustainable solution that works for those communities, that works for those who have these objects, and that ultimately requires process and shared governance. That is one of the recurring themes of my talk today. Mission-driven institutions find their way forward every time by engaging thoughtfully in shared governance and knowing what that is and how various stakeholders can inform decision making. And I think the resolution to the question of cultural property will be found that way through leaders in Berlin and in New York and in London and in Africa and every other place that's concerned, finding ways to achieve common ground for the long-term benefit of all. So I'm sure we'll come back to that in the discussion period. So I will move on to a couple of other topics. As we think about collection development, one set of issues is cultural heritage in the ancient world. Another is, what's the right and most responsible way to spend our resources on building our collections? This work of art, which is probably known to all of you, may very well have been by Leonardo da Vinci, and you could buy it for $450 million. Actually, you can't, because it's sold for 400 to someone else, $450 million. What kinds of investments should institutions like the Metropolitan be making? Or maybe more modestly, that's an extreme example. This painting by Basquiat, sold recently at auction for $108 million. So if the Metropolitan wishes to have representation of artists like Basquiat, should we be marshalling our resources to spend $108 million on a work of art such as this one? We spend about $200 million a year on art, one way or the other. And we talk all the time about how best to use those resources for the long-term benefit of the institution. Modern and contemporary is a very difficult environment to navigate because these works of art are extraordinarily expensive and the, there's an open question as to whether they are of enduring importance and whether that's the best use of our, our resources. I don't have an answer to that question, but I'd like you to live with it a little bit and tell me what we should do. We recently had an exhibition on the work of Kerry James Marshall an extraordinarily talented and accomplished artist. It was a breakthrough exhibition for him and the value of his art is now beyond reach for us, too, at the Met. And that's a good thing for him. It's a complicated question about how when museums engage in, the, in contemporary art around the valuing of works of art, we think about that all the time. So collection development is something we think about very carefully. We don't have ready answers, but it requires debate and discussion. Let me touch on two other topics very quickly, and then we'll stop for discussion. Perhaps the least exciting topic to talk about is who actually should pay for the museum? Who should pay for culture? In the United States, and particularly at the Metropolitan, we receive very modest levels of government funding. Our budget receives about 9% of our operating budget from the city of New York. We receive no money from the federal government and modest occasional support from the state of New York. So the rest of that money has to be raised by the museum through acts of philanthropy and revenue-generating activities. 
the core challenge that we face is this massive building is very expensive to maintain on a year to year basis. And we have a moral obligation to invest in the infrastructure of the building so that this perpetual institution, which is what it is, is passed on to our successors at least as strong as we found it. And if we do not do that, we are inexorably diminishing an institution over time. When I took over at the Metropolitan, we did a massive study of our infrastructure. How much money is needed if we were to upgrade all systems? You walk through your house, you check the bathroom systems, the pipes, the electrical systems. It was over $800 million worth of investment that would be required, which for the Metropolitan is an extraordinary amount of money. For us to whittle away at that legacy problem will take decades. But we recognize from the outset we need to find a way to begin funding it today because we will not be a stronger institution if we don't. We cannot afford to have a museum that can't do justice to the quality of the collections within it. So I think about that question all the time. Then there is the almost existential problem of what, what actually economists call cost disease, and that is a problem associated with paying highly skilled labor in environments that don't track with productivity enhances in the overall economy. In other words, you can pay lawyers as their billable rates go up in the world, but if you've got curators, you can't be giving them raises at the same rates as lawyers. But skilled labor over time requires enough compensation to make it worthwhile for good people to go into these careers. Over the long term, if we don't make the right investments in skilled labor, we will see a diminishment in human capital. That requires us to grow our budget every year. This is really boring, I recognize. We're 10 seconds away from being done with this point. <laughs> uh, over time, all universities in the United States, all cultural institutions, will see their costs grow in excess of their revenues. It is, therefore, we're always driving off a cliff. But how do we continue to push the cliff away? At the same time, we describe these organizations as perpetual institutions that are supposed to live forever. So how do we invest in infrastructure to maintain them, support high quality labor, pay competitive salaries, generate enough revenue without corrupting the institution and turning it into a commercial enterprise that's more about revenue generation than mission realization? These are the kind of questions one has to be self-conscious about. Not to answer them, but it's a chronic problem to be managed. And if it's not top of mind, then people start making shortcuts, like, defer, like avoiding de deferred maintenance because somebody else can worry about that after. We don't wish to do that. The answer to that question, the, in, as I think about it, the question of economic sustainability, is first of all the principle of co-investment. Because we have a diverse array of, array of revenue sources, we have a little money from the government, we generate revenue, we have philanthropic activities, we do all of these things. It gives us independence. We can develop a program where we're not accountable to the government or to any lead donor or anyone else because that diversity of revenue sources is effectively an insurance policy that allows us to maintain an independent voice. It also gives us financial resilience in a difficult economy because if there is a diverse enough source of revenue, then we can weather one issue or another. We've worked very hard in the last few years to build a strong, diverse sources of revenue in order to ensure both of those things. And that too requires shared governance with the leadership of the board, the board of trustees, with our administration, with our curators, with our donors, and with the public. And we have had to use all of those relationships to make difficult changes in our financial model over the last several years, which we can talk about later if if you'd like to know more. So as I talk about infrastructure, I wanted to show you this beautiful image of the skylight project that is underway today. The European painting galleries of the museum, which represent about one city, New York City block of skylights, were, built, were installed in the 1930s. They were due to be replaced in the 1960s. We're replacing them now. They are sadly out of date, and the project costs $150 million. And when that project is finished, Nothing anybody cares about is going to look any different. We're just going to have a better roofing system. But we must do this, so we have to figure out a way to spend $150 million of capital on a project that no donor wants to support. And we have done that. We have figured out a way to do that. Um, and this is why. This is the metropolitan you never see. That's what's behind the screen up by the skylights. That was installed during the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. And, <laughs> 
it needed to be replaced. So we think about these issues as well. How do we make sure we're making those kinds of investments? My last topic I'll touch on very briefly, which is in some ways the most um, complicated one. This is an image by Baltus from 1938 called Therese Dreaming. It has been in our collection for decades, and it is controversial. It has always been controversial. But in recent last year or so, there were a group of, of uh, visitors to the museum who challenged us to remove this from view because it's offensive, or at least to put a sign outside the gallery saying, beware, there is offensive art inside. <laughs> and we had discussions about what should we do, what obligations do we have. And I can talk more about this if you'd like to later. We did not do either of those things. We invite people to turn away if they're not interested or if they're offended. But we didn't believe this was an egregious act that was intended to offend the public. This was installed in the museum probably in the 1960s. It's just the moment has changed, but we took it very seriously. This is one example. Another would be what happens if an artist turns out to be a bad actor. So here we have a painting by Chuck Close, who was recently accused in the Me Too movement of mistreating women in his studio egregiously. We did not take this work of art down from the wall. We, one can engage in a slightly tendentious discussion. Well, I think we ought to take Car Caravaggio down because he was a murderer after all. And why wouldn't we? Why are we, we showing support for someone like that? So the question then becomes, where do you draw the line? There is a line. I don't mean to suggest there's no line. But I think we need to be honest about the fact that that line is a complicated one to draw. And the best way to figure that out is to think about it, to talk about it, to listen carefully, and to engage in, again, what I would call shared governance. Because if one person makes a decision, almost certainly they will get it wrong, and it won't benefit the community over the long term. So what we decided in this case was to leave this painting on the wall, but then we had the problem of what to do when the public doesn't like it. And this young woman engaged in a protest in front of this painting, um, and our security guards are not trained as to what to do <laughs> in a case like this. So um, she didn't stay long. She had the photograph taken, and it was actually posted in the New York Times in a major story, which was, I think, part of, of uh, what this was about, was to bring attention to this issue. So our view on these questions is people have every right to be offended. They have every right to protest, but not in a way that disrupts the experience of others, not in a way that places the art itself at risk. Now, one could argue this did offend others, but she scrammed out of there very quickly, and we didn't have to actually take very long. Finally, we had a work of art. We had an exhibition of Raghavir Singh's photographs, this extraordinarily talented street photographer whose work from the 60s and 70s was collected in the museum, and we had an exhibition. And it turned out that there was an accusation that he had raped someone during his time as, a, as an artist. He had since died. And the question is, what do we do about allowing people? Should we have the exhibition? We didn't know the facts of the case. Should we do something? Should we place a sign outside? Should we allow this person to organize a protest? So we worked productively with the woman and the group, and they were allowed to protest, and they did in front of the exhibition. But they did it in a way that was not disruptive. They had the opportunity to tell their story, and they did. Finally, the last of these complicated topics has to do with donors. The Metropolitan, and this is one example of many. I, I only point out the Sacklers because we're facing it today and because everybody knows who the Sacklers are. The Metropolitan has been receiving gifts from the Sackler family for more than a half century. There are dozens and dozens of gifts we've received from them. Some of the Sacklers who made these gifts had no connection whatsoever to Purdue Pharma and OxyContin, and others were very directly involved in those enterprises. And by the way, at the moment, it isn't clear what their level of culpability is. So in order to address this issue, we have been accosted by the media appropriately. What is our position? Historically, the museum would have taken the position that we don't have anything to say. And I think that's incorrect. That's not a responsible position to take. We need to figure it out. And we need to have a series of principles that allow us to articulate our position. Because keeping the money, keeping the name, is a decision. It's just one we're not defending. So I've asked the board leadership and museum leaders to convene in a, in a discussion, and we're going to have a series of, of discussions around how do we identify the principles that ought to be associated with how we determine so gifts from donors. One needs to tread very carefully. As one university said to me, when I, a very eminent university in the United States, I asked them this question, and they said, well, historically, 
We distinguish between honorary degrees, where we really care who they are, from the gifts of donors, where that isn't our principal concern. We don't do an investigation into the background of every person who gives us money to make sure that they are above board on various kinds of conditions. The world around us is changing. We cannot afford the luxury of being indifferent to the question. We must be responsive. We ought to lead by figuring out in a thoughtful way how to address those questions so that we can educate the public and make better decisions. And that work is underway today, which is why, as I said from the outset, this sort of work is also an opportunity for us. It's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. So finally, as I think about these issues, as I think about the questions all of us face, I come back to a few core principles that I use in thinking about them that I think is helpful. The first is to reflect deeply on the mission. Why are we really here and what is our purpose? Are we here to provide entertainment? Are we here to provide deep scholarly insight and knowledge? Are we here to educate? It could be all those things, but to be smart and thoughtful about that. To appreciate the value of the voices of the stakeholders who make the institution thrive. The most obvious one is the board because they have fiduciary responsibility for the institution. They must be in the conversation. In my experience in the United States, very often they are not. They're not invited into that conversation. They're invited to make philanthropic gifts and to come to dinners and openings and that's it. And I believe that's not responsible shared governance. One needs the right board that can engage thoughtfully in challenging us and helping us, but also so with the curators or in a university with the faculty and the students. It's a cumbersome process to advance that kind of leadership model, but it doesn't work effectively any other way. And that's a fundamental difference between mission-driven institutions and the for-profit sector, where the priorities and the concerns are different, rightfully so. So to be thoughtful about that. To appreciate the value of co-investment where you can find it. Even if you're a government institution, as many in Berlin are, are there ways you can generate revenues across government entities or the private sector that give you enough latitude to do difficult things that you might not be able to do otherwise? To be transparent, it was the Met went through a very difficult financial experience a few years ago, and I made the difficult decision to tell our story to the public, to our staff, to the media, because we needed to, we needed to fix it, and we needed to own it, and we needed to then address that. And there was no way to do that without telling the truth. And we spent several months getting hammered in the media. But then it got better. And then we built trust with everyone. So transparency is always important. And then finally, a little bit of humility. We're all in these jobs because first and foremost, we're lucky. So we need to remember that as we do these jobs, that the voices around us help us make better decisions. And that's an obvious point but it's actually a useful one when your back is to the wall and you need to make a decision. It's always useful to listen to others as well. So I'm very happy to pause there and open it up for discussion as you would like. Thank you. Let me start, if I may, the, the, you started out talking about questions about how museums engage with their public. And it's very interesting to me in three very uh, uh, fraught situations that uh, we've seen recently, I, I, I've observed personally. Um, the invasion of Baghdad, uh, the ISIS depredations in, in Syria, and the uprising in Tahrir Square in Egypt. In each of those cases, the relevant museums became focuses of resistance. So in Baghdad, the curators, as you know, walled up the entrance to the main galleries. Many of them took home the most valuable artifacts and protected them. And although there was some looting, they didn't get the, the, the major artifacts. These people were in fear of their lives. They were shooting outside in the street. In Palmyra, the main curator refused to bow to ISIS, and he paid with his life. He did. And in Egypt, you had several million people milling around Tahrir Square. And there were a couple of, uh, I think, stones thrown. A few windows were broken, but nothing was taken from you know, one of the most, well, for Egypt, the most spectacular uh, um, cultural resource they have. Um, explain that to me. When people were literally in fear of their lives, and yet they felt this was something that was worth standing up for. Well, first of all, these are passionate people who have chosen their vocations carefully, their professions, and they are curators. The first and primary responsibility of curators is to protect the art. 
and to make sure that what they're doing is ensuring the longevity of these objects for generations to come. That's thing one. We don't, ex we don't exhibit anything that is at risk. We don't lend works of art that are at risk. We make sure that the first primary obligation of the, to the object is met before we do anything else. And I think the front lines of that are these curators in these, or these museum leaders in these places where they're facing that kind of, of extraordinary challenge. Ultimately, these are acts of extraordinary courage. No one would blame them for fleeing with everyone else, but this they did not do because they believe deeply in that fundamental responsibility. I have to say, I'm an art historian, and I've spent my whole career in this field, but I was struck, if one of the things that I was struck most readily by, immediately by when I came to the Met, was how powerful that concern is everywhere. If you go down to the lowest level of the museum, where there are pathways everywhere, it's a city down there, everywhere you look, there are signs that say, yield to the art, because the art always comes first for its protection, for its maintenance. That's why we have such a large conservation department. So I think it's second nature to people in this profession to do everything they can, because as soon as the objects are lost, they're never regained. One can negotiate a peace treaty, but human life and works of art cannot be reclaimed if they're destroyed. And so that is what I think why they did that. And it was inspiring to all of us, which is why everyone wanted to help as best they can. You outlined very uh, nicely the value of the Met to New York City, uh, an institution that grew up from its um, aspirations to be the Louvre, no, no, <laughs> the Louvre. Um, but over the years, as you said, it grew one gift at a time. And I think today you said it's just 9% of its budget comes from the government. Um, as you said, in Berlin, the model is often different, a lot more government support. But nonetheless, the museums in Berlin also express something about this city. And we've got, I know Herdolo is here from, from the Humboldt Forum and, and Sir David Chipperfield, who was involved in the Noyes Museum. Yes. Can you tell me what, how, what, what do you feel about the, 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 the importance of museums to Berlin, the city that, after all, was, was in ashes, dust, yes. eff effectively, 70 years ago? Well, first of all, the cultural life in this city is extraordinary. You're all here because you believe in that. And it's, um, I've never been to a city where that's so clear. Every time I come, I'm inspired by the level of engagement people have in the world of ideas and art and culture. It's remarkable. So I think the museum life in Berlin is a reflection of that. There is the very difficult history that one contends with for a city that was virtually destroyed and its cultural patrimony and its history with it. But what's being created is a model for the world that the museum projects that are underway in Berlin are extraordinary everywhere you turn. They're interesting cultural institutions and vibrant support for them. It is, I think, a tribute to the government that they wish to make an investment in that kind of level of cultural visibility and importance to understand something about not only your own history, but the world history. The more one understands and appreciates that, it's perhaps an axiom to say that it builds empathy, but it actually does. It certainly does to increase people's understanding. So it is an investment in society and civilization that's enduring. Um, that model probably, the, the United States model wouldn't work in Berlin because it isn't how people are set up. If you had to raise 90% of the funding for museums here through philanthropic support, it wouldn't be achievable. So there are many models that work. I think the core question is, what do they allow an institution to do? It must have an independent voice. It must be able to engage different audiences. It must do justice to the scholarly, scientific, and aesthetic concerns that great works of art require. And I think, I think there's a model here. It's, uh, every time I'm here, I learn from this experience. And it's just, um, so we have something to share, and so too does Berlin. Clearly, it speaks at a fundamental level about the values of the community, because there are a lot of other things you could do with your money and your time. Um, allow me for me to ask one more question, then I'll open it up to, to the audience. I'm sure there are many questions out there. But I, I just want to push you a little bit more on the very heated um, debate over restitution and how much one has to give back and so on and so forth. I came here from Los Angeles, and as you know, Jim Kuno, who runs the Getty, has quite strong views on that. His fundamental argument is that uh, as an institution, a, a big museum can preserve and... Uh, and show 
artifacts to a lot more people than a little church in Italy that's visited once a week by 20 tourists. And that, I mean, right. I, I'm sort of caricaturing it, but that's basically his argument. Um, and that has some value, I think. Uh, but it's, it's, it, that's one side of the argument. And then there are people that say, no, this belongs to Italy or whatever, whichever country we're talking about. How does this, where does this argument go? Because you could see the extremist argument was the Met should have nothing that was created outside the United States. That's the extreme, one extreme. Right. The other extreme is, well, you put, bring it all back to a country where it could get destroyed by ISIS. That's the other extreme. So where, where, did, where does this end up, do you think? Or is this a constant? Well, I really don't think there's an ending up. I think we're, in, we're embarking on a process that's productive and fruitful to engage in if we can find the right way to talk about that. And there are all kinds of considerations that go into a thoughtful decision. To say that we're going to keep your art because we can do better with it than you can is patronizing. On the other hand... There needs to be some recognition that there's value to the world in having works of art distributed in different places. Even if we can all take care of it equally well, which, by the way, that's a fixable problem. If some museum can't do it so well, then we'll help them. How about if we help train their staff and build their institutions and help them to restore to their own culture some of these objects that help give meaning and significance to them? Those, so those solutions are achievable, but they're not quick because there are too many vested interests that are entwined, and one just can't ex cathedra make a decision to solve that. It's, uh, I don't know, how did the Louvre get its art? Should we talk about the Elgin marbles? There are these questions, every museum has these questions, and it's not appropriate or right to say that we're going to talk about the Benin bronzes today because President Macron brought that up, but we're not going to talk about other things that nobody else brought up that are equally issue-laden. So I think we need to find a thoughtful venue for transparent discussion, around the five or six issues that would attend to any resolution of that question. The rights, the issue of legal rights, the issue of the weight of history. I mentioned some of them in my remarks. You start there. These are what we're going to tackle. If we're going to get this right, we have to check all these boxes somehow. We're not going to make a decision that everybody in this room is going to agree with. But let's have a fair, transparent process that tries to do justice to the core values we all have, which is to protect the works of art, to give an opportunity for the world to see them and appreciate them and learn from each other, to advance the mission of education, and so forth. And there is no quick answer. There just isn't. And politicians for... I love politicians just like the next guy. That isn't their business. That is not their business. What they should do is they should... If I were the president of France or the United States or any other place... I would suggest a process that can be convened to bring deep and thoughtful answers. If we can mobilize the wisdom of the world and the energy of countries everywhere, we sure as hell can solve this problem. But we're not going to do it by next Tuesday when there's a press conference. So I would suggest that's the way to work the problem. But they didn't ask me, so I'm just... <laughs> Constantine has a microphone. If you have a question, please put your hand up and, and please tell us who you are. And um, Constantine, do you want to start this two the back there and then we'll work over forward. Hello, good evening. My name is Florian Kobler from uh, the art book publisher Taschen. I have a question regarding the two million artifacts that you have been mentioning. I recently had a conversation with a curator here who will be exhibiting in the Humboldt Forum who has uh, con control over 40,000 objects and can show 20. And I suppose it's probably similar in some parts of your collection. And uh, just to get a sense of scale, how many artifacts can you exhibit? And my main question is, what do you do with the uh, ugly ducklings hidden away or never explored? And is there something that uh, digital transformation um, adds to that question or to that approach, or in the future will add, uh, to explore or exploit or research or enhance that part of your collection? Yes, it's a wonderful question. We have about two million works of art, of which I should say about a million and a half of them are works on paper that cannot be displayed on a continuous basis or they would be damaged by exposure to light. So we rotate those, and that's as we should do that. The rest of them, we still only show a fraction of probably 30% or 20% of the collection. Our goal is to display every work of art that deserves to be displayed, that is worthy of the Met. If it is never going to find its way onto our gallery walls, then we should deaccession the work of art. There's no reason, no one benefits by us keeping works of art locked away that we're absolutely certain we will not use or we will not ever display. Sometimes those questions are not that easy to answer because it might be that during from one period to another, 
there is a, a question about whether we should deaccession that second-rate painting by Rubens. That happened because it was Rubens, you know, we learned our lesson. That was many years ago. Uh, on the other hand, if it's clear to us that the work of art doesn't have a future with us, we do de deaccession it unless there's a condition on the gift agreement. And in the past especially, sometimes we would receive a gift of 10 great paintings out of 30 not-so-great paintings. And the condition is you keep them all or you get none of them. So we have the six Van Goghs and the three Monets and the Pizarro here, and we have the other 30s by artists you never heard of somewhere else. In some cases, we can lend them to other museums. We do a lot of that. We have works of art all over the United States that are loaned for long-term periods. But we have too much art in storage. And because, as I said earlier, our com commitment in the first instance is to the care of the objects, every work of art we have, even the ugly ducklings, need to be maintained in a, cli in a climate-controlled, humidity-controlled environment, and it's very expensive. So it is not in our best interest to be housing lots of works of art we have no use for. But sometimes it's not possible, and sometimes there's too much ambiguity. But we're working through that, and we have challenged all the departments to identify where they think they can deaccession. That'll never end as a process, but that's the path we're on. Hi, my name is Topper Sherwood. I'm an independent contractor. I worked in the United States um, in the 80s and 90s during the culture wars. Um, <laughs> and... Um, it seemed to me that, well, I guess my question is, to what degree do you support the government, the federal government programs, which were so really important to a lot of mainstream, a lot of middle America programs at that time, um, through the NEA and the NEH? Right. You yourself have been a beneficiary of an NEH grant. Um, and we're watching these programs being openly attacked, I mean, if not... Right totally defunded, which are the, the kind of standard bearers for a lot of the, through middle America, you know, uh, people aspiring for these grants, even though they might be small seed grants. Um, and in your, in your embrace and your, your seeking of independence from the federal government, to what degree are you helping the enemies of public funding for the art, arts, if I might be so bold to put it that way, Right. And what are you doing to combat that, if anything? Well, I think, first of all, the United States government and every other government, particularly in a democracy, has a fundamental responsibility to make an investment in culture. Because culture does help to elevate a civilization in ways that advance the purposes of government and civic society. There's no question in my mind, in the same way that education does. So every enlightened nation ought to be investing in culture in different ways. I am not opposed to federal funding for culture. If they wished, if the government wanted to support the Met, I'd be very comfortable accepting their support. It's a matter of proportion and the agreement around which those gifts are accepted, or that funding is accepted. And I think what makes an organization most healthy and resilient in the United States is diversity of funding sources. But if the government wanted to provide 20, 30, 40 percent, that's fine. I, don't, I think that's perfectly okay. The NEA and the NEH collectively are an infinitesimally small amount of money in the federal budget. It's, there are, I don't know, three or four hundred million dollars total. It's not much money. It's, it's one little airplane costs more than that in the Defense Department budget. So it's a symbolic gesture and it goes a very long way, in, exactly as you described, for communities that have very limited access to resources. They don't have easy access to philanthropic participation. Working class communities that don't have wealthy donors the NEA and the NEH do really important work, and they send a signal that the government cares about the well-being of its population by investing in those things that elevate us. And the NEA and the NEH budgets could be 10 times greater than they are, and they would still be a very modest blip in the amount of contribution that they make to cultural life in the United States. But to eliminate them is absolutely and only a political gesture about what government ought to be doing and what control they ought to be having over programming. So I think it's much more healthy to have debates about that, just as there were in the 1980s, as we talked about at dinner, about these issues related to exhibitions that were extremely offensive to many people. Should the NEA or the NEH be supporting those kinds of exhibitions? The right answer to that question is debate. 
What do we learn from that? How do we think about where those investments should be made? But to take them away is to undermine a core principle of our, of our, of our government, I think. There's a couple of hands up at the very back, if you can get your way back there. And then we'll move forward. Yeah, we have a gentleman here, too. Hi, um, my name's Jemima Montague. I'm a UK curator, I'm currently setting up a, a museum and education cultural centre in the Czech Republic, um, but I live in Berlin. Um, and uh, <laughs> to show what a cultural nexus it is. But actually, my question is a little bit about to challenge this question about the effectiveness of the Berlin model. And I'm, excuse me for infuriating this audience. I am relatively new to Berlin, and I don't pretend to, to understand and know how the system works um, very well. However, when you look at visitor statistics, you can see that Berlin museums are not even in the top 10 within Europe. Um, uh, sorry, pause. Um, when you look at, um, for instance, I went to the Kunstgewerbe Museum recently um, on a rainy Sunday. It was dead, it was empty, nobody's there. Could, could you make sure you keep this as a question, please? <laughs> because I have an answer. <laughs> Great. Well, he has all the answers. <laughs> be between your model of 9% of public funding and uh, enormous cultural philanthropy in the U.S., and this culture of enormous amounts of public funding and uh, limited culture of philanthropy. Um, what, is the, what is the model we seek in countries like the Czech Republic and many developing nations where uh, there's no culture of philanthropy and no public funding? Yeah, well. Thank you. I, I, I cannot tell you what the right answer is in Berlin or in the Czech Republic. I can only say that that one has to operate within the context of the government and the economy that you inherit. And in the United States, there was the principle of philanthropy is fundamental to our higher education system and our cultural system. Absolutely core, fundamental. Without that, there wouldn't be the great universities or the great cultural institutions. So it's a very different model here. What I can say as a visitor here is that I am absolutely inspired by the level of commitment at every level to building institutions of enduring importance that do justice to the quality of the collections and to providing something for the citizenry that can only be good and healthy. How it's paid for and what that, that transaction ultimately looks like is a much deeper question. If the museum leaders feel that their flexibility and their independence is encumbered by the funding model, then that's a long-term problem to be addressed. But I, I have no idea how to do that in the near term here. There's a gentleman right here. I'm Michael Philip, uh, Museum Barberini, Potsdam. Uh, thank you very much for giving these insights in the giant cosmos of your uh, museum. It was very interesting. I only missed one point, uh, the audience of your muse m museum. Uh, so do, do you care about your visitors? Do <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my question is, yes. what about the education program? Uh, are you busy with uh, minorities, uh, how to speak to, to minorities? Uh, so I, I missed yes. this point a little. It, 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 we're very, I didn't say very much about that just because I was racing through topics, but we have 7.5 million visitors to our museum a year, and we are deeply committed to engaging all of the different audiences that come to the museum. Because we are such a large, comprehensive place, we can mount ec educational programs for school children. We can do high-level scholarly conferences. We can publish scholarly books. We can publish children's books. And so we do all of those things. Most museums don't have the resources necessarily to do all of those things. But we are very concerned with that question. One of the major issues we face today is we've just put in place a, a, what we call a diversity, equity, inclusion, and access plan. How do we make sure that the public we wish to serve, which is all of the public, and the staff that we hire reflect the world around us in fundamental ways, and that they feel comfortable coming up those majestic steps of the metropolitan and taking advantage of what we have to offer. That's a difficult problem to solve, and we've been working on that. I could have spoken about that at length this evening. I'm sorry I didn't. But it's, uh, it, there's no question it's an issue that we face. And we've made very significant progress. Uh, but that's not easy. 
it's a long-term challenge, and we're making we're underway now doing that. Okay, let's. Uh, there's a hand up there, please. Thank you. I'm Patrick Barners. I'm an editor with the newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. What's your policy on visitors taking photographs of things in the museum? Is it, um, is it, uh, would it be an issue of copyright and of property rights for the, um, for the museum if people take photographs and then distribute them? And related question uh, uh, regarding uh, the digital images which you, which you make. Do you see it as part of your mission basically to provide them for free for everybody who is interested and might not have the chance to go to New York and see the things in place? Or is it also um, a, a way of raising revenue? We're very proud of the fact, I'll take your second question first, we have placed almost the entirety of our collection in public access. So we have 400,000 works of art at a very high level of digital quality publishable quality that is open access for any reason. If you want to create a commercial product using those images, you're free to do so. Because we believe deeply that that kind of access is fundamental to our responsibility as an educational institution. That's the main reason, and we believe in that. It's also impossible to enforce any other policy very effectively. <laughs> and it's, that isn't, but it's just the reality of, of uh, but we're proud of that, and we worked very hard. We were the first major museum in the world to, to, to do that with so many works of art. We have the same policy in the museum. People can take pictures of things so long as they're not disruptive. If they're light sensitive, they cannot use a flash. But everything in the museum you can take pictures of. Uh, it's a puzzle to me that people come and they just want to take selfies of uh, the work of art. But if it gets them in the museum and they're looking around, then um, I'll go with the times. But yes, everything is available. Um, there was one more hand here. Yes, right there, please, that lady. Thank you. And I think we make this the last question because we need to Hi, um, my name's Kat Anderson. I'm an artist and curator. Um, uh, I'm interested to know more about um, your, the lines you were talking about, the lines you draw in terms of um, the ethics around patrons and artists. Right. Um, to know more about the, pro the process of that. And also, I'm interested in where interpretation, um, interpretation factors into like, how you communicate these difficult conversations to the public. Right. We, uh, to be sure, all museums face these issues from time to time, and they have for a very long time. But in recent years, we face them very frequently. So we had a couple of issues come to the fore in rapid succession about a year or two ago. And we responded to them in the moment by, should we put a sign up, should we take that picture down, by convening a discussion with the curators who are closest to it and coming up with an approach built around our core values, which is I'm very comfortable making people uncomfortable. They, are, they have a right to walk away. They have a right to protest. They have a right to write an editorial. They don't have a right to censor what professionals who work very deeply in the field think is a responsible presentation of our cultural heritage. So they, let's mix it up and have a debate about that. So we left things on the wall for that reason. But after a couple of these incidents, it became clear to me that we might benefit from a more thoughtful and broader discussion. So I convened all of the curatorial department heads and conservation department heads and professional staff. And we sat around for two or three long meetings to discuss these issues more generally. What obligations do we have as we think about program development? How explicit do we want to be to challenge the public? How do we think about drawing those lines? To be sure, those issues are resolved in different ways in different areas. So if you're in the world of contemporary art, your line is very different from if you're in the world of tapestries in the Renaissance or something. So these questions we learned from each other. We did not identify a set of policies. We talked about principles, and some of which I talked about tonight. And we respond to each case as it comes up with those principles in mind. We are transparent with everyone, including the people who wish to have us change our behavior. We invite them to meetings. We invite them to write an editorial. You know, there are things they can do. But what we're not willing to do is go down a path where we believe we're limiting access to the free exchange of ideas at a level that we think is important. And the line is not how comfortable people are. That's a problem that I think our society in the United States is facing. It's very serious. 
Well, on that note, <laughs> um, we've had you up here for a long time. Um, the concept of, of, of ongoing debate, I think, is something that we would share here in the Academy. So thank you for making that point so elegantly. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. It's always great to hear the questions from a great Berlin audience. But thank you so much for your presentation and your, and your responses. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all very much.